were assigned us various places. About a third went to um, Washington for one project. The third stayed in Tennessee, and a third of us came here. So uh, we were sent by a slow-moving train to Lamy, and then we were bussed up to Los Alamos. And that was the beginning of my career here in Los Alamos. So when did you first come to Los Alamos? Uh, March 25th or so, uh, 1944. The, uh, this place had been in operation for about a year then. I, I know some of the first people who came here started about April, April 15th and uh, 43, <clears throat> but it was very slow going. They had to build buildings, and uh, some of the people lived over in uh, the National Park, Bandelier, while they were building barracks. And uh, I was in the first barracks for the Special Engineer Detachment. There were 150 people in that barracks, 75, a U shaped building. And in the middle of a U-shaped building were the latrines, separated both sides. And on one side was my uh, bunk, and on the other side was Green Glass, a very famous uh, spy, so-called. Uh, he was a machinist, actually, in uh, wor working on various forms in. <clears throat> My first assignment, as I said, was uh, counting neutrons, and this is done chemically. It turns out if you take a solution of uh, manganese in a balloon flask and uh, uh, put a neutron emitting substance in the middle of that flask, you'll knock the permanganate apart and you get a precipitate, something called manganese dioxide. You filter off this manganese dioxide and you find out it's become radioactive. And it has a beta uh, emission. So what you do is count the betas and from the number of neutrons uh, dependent upon the number of neutrons you, you get a certain amount of radioactive uh, manganese. So <clears throat> by counting the manganese, <clears throat> we were able to see how many neutrons were being emitted. <clears throat> the thing that's important is that when you were trying to detect as little as 300 neutrons per second, there were no counter. Uh, <clears throat> there were there were no neutron counters available at that time, which could reliably count the neutrons. So that's why we had to do it by this very slow process, uh, radioactively. Anyway, we continued doing that until somebody discovered that if they uh, well, it turns out the substance they were using uh, to produce the neutrons was polonium. Polonium is an alpha emitter, so when it emits neutrons, uh, impinging on, uh, say, silver, it will uh, uh, produce a neutron. The so-called alpha N reactions are very famous. <clears throat> anyway, someone working in the laboratory found out that if he distilled the polonium in a vacuum, they'd get rid of any oxygen from the air. It turns out the oxygen, when it was hit by uh, the alpha, was producing neutrons that we didn't want. So at that time, uh, 
there was no more need for us to count neutrons because they went to zero. And uh, <clears throat> so that meant that the process that they were going to use for the initiator was successful. And that was a, one of the big problems of, of the atomic bomb was to make sure that you had a neutron-free start. <clears throat> so then I went on to another project in, involving radioactivity. This was to take a big a source of uh, radiation mounted in the center of a mock-up of the whole bomb. And as it was imploded, uh, the intensity of the signal would drop off. The radioactive lanthanum would be um, detected uh, by a series of detectors outside and oscilloscopes. These things would be blown up, but the traces they got electronically could be used to determine um, what the what the reduction in intensity was, and von Neumann, who was here, worked out a method of determining how much compression had taken place. Now this is very important because the critical mass of a bomb is determined by how much you can compact that uranium and confine the neutrons in, within the bomb rather than having them wasted. So that we were able to determine exactly, or not me, but uh, uh, senior scientists who calculate and determine how much uranium they actually needed, enriched uranium, how much they needed, to produce a, a workable bomb. So that, those are the two things that are worked on. I got a letter from um, Oppenheimer at the end of the war, just before he was leaving, uh, stating all this and commending me. He talked to the group leader and the group leader told him what I'd done and so he wrote the letter. I, I think most people don't seem to realize that we had our day, and that day is basically done. There's no reason to have seven or 8,000 personnel in the laboratory anymore. The main function uh, is to uh, maintain the stockpile, and uh, that's, that's a big job. Uh, there's this business of hardening weapons so they last longer on the shelf. You're using radioactive materials, not just the plutonium, which lasts forever, but there is a problem. There's a tendency for oxidation and developing films, and when you're talking about something where a thousandth of an inch makes a difference. You don't want stuff to creep oxides to form and sort of expand and makes things difficult to assemble or even disassemble if you want to uh, refit them in some way. And same way with tritium. Tritium with a short half-life of 12 years uh, has to be replaced uh, to, to maintain the same strength of bomb. And uh, You think about it, uh, if anybody ever uses a bomb, you failed. Uh, the whole thing has gone all wrong. And uh, So first of all, I don't see any need for many bombs. You, you might want a hundred or so, or even three hundred, so in case somebody drops one. 